Thank you, Emily, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to thank Cape Ontario for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm always excited to talk about these issues and uh, add to the conversations that I think are necessary to move us forward. I do want to acknowledge um, that I am uh, coming in from the territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And this region was also uh, uh, part of the Underground Railroad Network. Um, so in keeping with the land acknowledgement and the reflection that we've already had, thanks to Dr. Groot, um, just want to acknowledge and reflect on the land. So thank you again, Dr. Groot, for leading us off and for a fascinating presentation. Um, and I want to thank everyone here tonight. I hope we'll have a great conversation and Q&A session afterwards. I want to start with a quote from Bonnie, who worked for over 35 years at the Ambassador Bridge, who was reflecting on her breast cancer diagnosis. diagnosis. She said, the environment, I have no control over that other than quitting my job. But the air that we breathe, I don't feel like I have any control over that at all. And this is a key point that I want to use to frame my presentation tonight, which is to say the problem of control over exposures in the environments that we live, work and play in. So to that end, I'm going to talk to you tonight about my research with women workers at the Ambassador Bridge, as well as give you a sneak peek at an upcoming uh, CAPE report uh, that looks at the relationship between traffic, uh, traffic related air pollution and health impacts. The research and the connection between air pollution and health brings out that in order to address environmental injustices as part of the bigger picture of health, we have to identify the systemic contributions and the contexts that we are living in in order to achieve justice and the right to a healthy environment for everyone. So a quick agenda for uh, how I'll take us through the talk tonight. I'm going to give you very brief background. I'll give you an overview of what we know of health impacts of air pollution, leaning in part uh, from the data that will be in that upcoming TRAP report. Um, I'm going to talk about the case of the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, Ontario, which was the subject of my uh, dissertation research. I'm going to uh, build on the words of the women in, in the study um, about what they see as advocacy roles for health professionals professionals in addressing um, the impacts of air pollution and environmental exposures and breast cancer and other health impacts. And then I'll talk a little bit about interventions, again, in part using some of their words and um, other sort of identified areas where we can intervene for prevention. So as a sociologist with a specialty in social justice, I'm trained to see the interconnectedness of our social and political systems with health. And COVID-19 has really, and especially with the denial of uh, the fact that the virus is airborne, has starkly illustrated for us that governance really matters to environmental health. I know from my own work that we can't look at health without looking at inequalities, power and control. So to address air pollution and adverse health outcomes, we must look through the environmental justice lens and we need research, media and advocacy to do that work. So to set the stage for what I want to share about the case study of the Ambassador Bridge, I'll give you a broad overview of what we know from the scientific literature about the association between air pollution and adverse health outcomes. Um, and as I said, part of this will come from a soon to be released uh, CAPE report on transportation or traffic related air pollution. So the research tells us, and we have quite a robust uh, literature on the impacts now, um, there are causal associations between air pollution and exposure and reduced lung function, asthma incidence and prevalence in children and adults, as well as allergic sensitization and response. Air pollution is also connected with respiratory diseases such as COPD and bronchitis, cardiovascular diseases and myocardial infarction, neurological impacts, declines in diseases, as well as neurodevelopmental delays and uh, adverse effects. It's also associated with pregnancy related outcomes, including congenital anomalies or rather abnormalities, uh, infertility and eclampsia. Air pollution is connected to cancers, and most significantly, we see lung cancer, leukemia, and breast cancer in the literature as connected with air pollution. 
We also know that it's connected with diabetes, obesity, dermatological outcomes, um, including eczema, and even mental health related outcomes, as Dr. Groot told us, um, including anxiety, depression, and even noise related stress from the sources of air pollution. Uh, air pollution exposure is also expressed in elevated mortality rates. And we also know that air pollution and environmental inequality are related. The health risks associated with air pollution are disproportionately experienced, of course, in communities with higher levels of air pollution. But often these are also communities where racialized people, indigenous people and poor people live. Research also, also shows us that air pollution exposure increases COVID-19 infections, uh, and transmission, and the risk of COVID-19 mortality. And because my research at the Ambassador Bridge focused on breast cancer, I'll note that the literature also tells us that studies find long-term traffic-related air pollution exposure as acts as a risk factor for breast cancer with changes in the activity of the DNA segment of breast cancer tissue as a potential mechanism for that outcome. There is evidence of an association between carcinogenic risk and traffic related air pollution exposure, especially because of the exposure to um, transportation sourced heavy metals, um, polycyclic aromatic, aromatic hydrocarbons um, and uh, polycyclic aromatic compounds. Um, these things are found in road dust, so part of, of traffic pollution uh, that is emanated as, as the vehicles are on the road. Um, and while air pollution exposure is generally associated with breast cancer among women of all ages, we know that perimenopausal and postmenopausal women are at a higher risk from those exposures. Increased levels of pollution in workplace environments due to high volumes of air pollution connected to traffic and industrial activity are in part related to a category of chemicals known as endocrine disruptors. Uh, these are commonly found in industrial and transportation related pollutants. And one of the things that we know about the relationship between breast cancer and endocrine disrupting chemicals is that uh, breast cancer rates among women who migrate to more industrialized countries where endocrine disrupting chemicals are more ubiquitous, their breast cancer rates tend to rise within a generation of, of arriving in that host country. So uh, really a, a distressing list of adverse health effects of air pollution, including breast cancer. And so from there, I'll talk about the case study of the Ambassador Bridge. Um, science has identified over 200 chemicals that uh, may increase breast cancer risk. Um, the current state of the evidence on breast cancer tells us that worldwide, 630,000 women are dying each year. 14 women die each day in Canada from breast cancer. Um, we know that about 5 to 10 percent of cases are genetic and that 70 to 90 percent of breast, cancer, breast cancers are linked to environmental influences. Now, most cancers come from multiple causes, but breast cancer's traditional popular narratives focus on individuals as separate from their social contexts, pointing largely to genetics or lifestyle factors and behavioral choices. And environmental exposures are largely omitted in those narratives, whether media or medical or just our, our, our traditional sociocultural narratives. So my research aim was to understand how that multiplicity of breast cancer risks and especially environmental risks are understood by women and how they enact agency in response to those known risks. So because of elevated breast cancer cases and known breast carcinogens in the environment and at the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, Ontario, I decided to investigate the knowledge of breast cancer's environmental links with the women who work there. So the Ambassador Bridge is the busiest border crossing in North America, where over 20,000 transport trucks and other vehicles cross each day. The bridge obviously has high levels of truck traffic and other industrial related air pollution as it sits in the watershed, or rather the airshed of uh, Michigan and even Ohio. Um, published estimates suggest that women at the Ambassador Bridge are being diagnosed with breast cancer at rates 16 times higher than the rest of the country. Although anecdotal evidence, including from my own research with the women at the bridge, suggests it could be as much as 42 times higher. 
So I interviewed uh, over 50 workers and community members and then did in-depth individual interviews with 25 women workers at the Ambassador Bridge. And I'm going to lean a lot on excerpts from those interviews and quotes from the women to convey what it is I learned uh, uh, from this study. And I'll start with Kathy, who said in her interview, put us all together and pretty soon you've just got lots of stories that all have the same ending. The observations and descriptions about the working conditions and the general environment around the bridge um, and the exposures seen as harmful to themselves as well as their fetuses, their children, their male co-workers were common among the women I spoke to. Uh, Mary described the environment in this way. She said, you have to think of it in the 60s and 70s. The traffic wasn't that bad. She explained, it wasn't that heavy. I would say it was more from the late 80s and on that it got bad. It got really busy. Sarah said, it's the diesel particulate matter and the sheer volume of trucks. Let's face it. Traffic was almost universally named and implicated in the women's narratives as an environmental breast cancer risk, the air pollution produced by the traffic. Susan said, I blame work for a lot of things because for 20 years, I worked around diesel fumes and exhaust from cars. It's always there. I think it is the big, biggest risk. I sit in that booth and breathe in those exhaust fumes every single day. We are all very much aware of the air pollution that we are exposed to every day. Lindsay told me, honestly, it's unlike any place I have ever worked. Of course, traffic is always coming through and I can tell you it never smelled good. You could even feel the grime. Coming out of work on any given day, you feel like, I just want to shower. Like you could definitely smell the fumes the trucks and the cars put out. Dana explained to me, when you see a semi-truck sitting there idling, they're waiting for however long for the vehicle in front of them to pass through customs. And that is just one truck. You can smell and see what's coming out of the vehicle. That cannot be good for the environment at all. Not with one truck but all of the trucks and not just at this border crossing, every border crossing, that's a lot. And think about how that affects the environment and that's your environment. And Dana went on to say, when you think about when you are, what you're actually breathing in, how does that affect your health? A lot of our toll collectors that worked down in the compound years ago have got cancer of some sort as they've gotten older. Retired after more than 30 years with Canada Customs and with a breast cancer diagnosis behind her, Janice explained, we all just thought, God, I hope we don't die here. Sorry. <laughs> Cindy told me, I remember when I first got hired going out there and they gave us a tour and I saw all those trucks and I was completely overwhelmed. I remember telling everybody I could think of, you wouldn't believe how many trucks crossed that bridge. And then I started working. And I think that it started slowly, slowly sort of dawned on me, seeing how dirty everything got in that environment. That's what I was breathing in every day. Samantha's description was evocative. She said, in my mind, that scene looked like how I would picture hell. That's what I always thought. This looks like hell and it was a horrible smell, and that was my impression of the whole region. Annie was angry about the lifestyle and behavior messaging in the media, and especially the message it sends about individual responsibility. She said, I do get a little angry when I read stories over and over, and they are saying it's because we have, we have higher than average cancer rates because we have higher smoking rates and higher obesity rates. I don't like that it sounds like you are just blaming the victim. Julie, a longtime worker at the bridge said, it's not normal. As much as the employer gets the air tested and they say, oh, it's fine, it's fine. I don't think that concentration of fumes in the air is normal. I don't think it's normal to be exposed to that amount for the average human. Erica told me, every once in a while, I will think about studies on cancer risks, like when I see the amount of trucks passing through, or even when I'm working in the booth. You see breast cancer awareness everywhere, but it's pink. You don't see what, what you can do about the information on how to prevent it. Lorraine described it this way. I think we all know diesel fumes and poor air quality is there. It's just that what can you do about it? Not too much. The port is going to run. Air quality is bad. I don't know what the solution is there, but it's definitely something that has gotten worse over the years. I think there must be some connection because too many people are getting sick. Lily talked about the air quality tests 
and her doubts about the results. She said, I have to wonder when did they do the study? On a Sunday when there were no trucks? She connects her doubt to the breast cancer cases, reporting that in a matter of three years, there were 18 women diagnosed. One woman reported to me she knew 30 women with breast cancer, about a third of the female workforce there. As well, at least two men in the workforce were diagnosed with breast cancer. From the women's standpoint, the air around them is key to understanding the high rates of breast cancer and ill health. Using an ecological framework as they did in their descriptions illustrates the interplay and connectedness between internal and external social factors in breast cancer risk. The ecological approach is captured in the words of Dr. Ted Shetler, who wrote The Ecology of Breast Cancer, The Promise of Prevention and the Hope of Healing. Dr. Shetler says, breast cancer is not only a disease of abnormal cells, but also of communities that we create and live in. The women's narratives identified those interrelated levels of the socio-ecological system and where they thought changes were needed to create the kind of communities we need to live in. And they included health professionals and physicians and their roles in addressing these problems. Cindy talked about the relationship between the medical sector and the workplace. She said, for the female members that we have, let's get some literature and say, here, think about this. Tell your doctor where you work. Tell them what you're exposed to. Cindy really felt that the conversations between the women and their doctors was necessary to increase awareness in the medical community of the potential of environmentally related illnesses and diseases that the workers at the bridge face and that to contribute to large scale and long-term recording of air pollution and occupational health and safety conditions, thereby representing a potential future data source for breast cancer's etiology. Fatima said, I think when you start at the bridge, you should go for a baseline medical on everything, hearing, sight, lungs, breast cancer, whatever. Shannon was surprised when I told her the science says that only five to 10% of breast cancer cases are genetic and up to 70% or higher are related to environments. She described her confusion. She said, when my doctor talked to me about breast cancer originally, he said that I had a lower chance of genetically having breast cancer because my mom had not had it. Mary also talked about her interactions with doctors when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, saying, one of the first questions they ask you is, is there cancer in your family? That's it, and that's the frustrating thing. Maggie also told me about her experiences with her doctors. She said, they asked me about family history. That was all the questions, family history. And Annie said, they did ask me at each initial stage and then actually afterwards too, if I had taken the pill, how old I was when I got my first period, if I still got them. So they asked about that kind of thing, estrogen. And then they asked if I had ever smoked and how much I drank. I do not think they ever asked me anything about the workplace. I was diagnosed the day after my birthday and I was shocked. I remember talking to my surgeon and I said to him, I thought I was low risk. And he kind of shrugged like, yeah, Bonnie asked, why didn't my doctor bring my job up? She knew what I was doing for the last 35 years. Why was that never brought up? I don't even know if they asked me where I worked or what I did for a living, especially at the cancer clinic. Why aren't they talking about that as part of your file? So many people at the bridge were getting cancer. At one point, there were eight or 10 of us in treatment at the same time. Sophia recalled a conversation with her oncologist saying, he suggested at the cancer center that a very strong possibility was environmental factors. Her doctor's recognition of environmental factors is notable as many women reported that their doctors rarely, if ever, related breast cancer and risk with their exposures. As an occupational cohort, the women at the bridge are disproportionately subjected to higher levels of environmental risk than other workers but their power as workers and women is disproportionate to their managers, their employer, governments and corporations, making them especially vulnerable to these health risks. There are structural, societal and systems level contributions to breast cancer at the bridge. Employers, governments and compensation boards failing to recognize these contributions are perpetuating injustice. And the women's stories really appeal for the need uh, to the need for population-based, prevention-focused public health. 
So where are interventions for prevention of breast cancer and other environmental related uh, illnesses needed? Well, Samantha talked about the failure to address breast cancer risk at the bridge as a question of culture. She asked, what do we value? Do we value women's health and how much? I think that that's where you would find that trade needs and pushing those trucks, pushing those cars, as we call it at work, is going to end up feeling more important to decision makers or power players than protecting an individual woman from risk. Samantha highlighted economic and political frameworks. She explains, because of the power of the lobby of the truck traffic, we get torn in two directions on this because our city is built on the auto industry and so is Detroit. And so that industry relies on something called just-in-time supply. This is the industry that defines our area. So when you talk about limiting environmental pollution, you are talking about limiting the trucks that deliver the different types of parts, which then limits the jobs of those workers who need those parts to build those vehicles. Samantha continues, when we talk about reducing the harmful effect of traffic, what you are really talking about is redefining the whole trade relationship with every other country in the world. So it's a tricky question and you feel too powerless. You are really talking about getting rid of our dependence on fossil fuel. Judy argued, we need to be the ones to advocate to government. Lily said, if breast cancer is caused by our environment, they have to be able to make revisions so that there is more protection, that there is better air ventilation, that there is better everything. And Jackie said, there is a definite obligation to make sure people are in a healthy and safe environment. Despite the barriers, the tensions, the contradictions and the unequal power relations, many of the women I talked to were optimistic, including Larissa, who said, I am hoping that if these risk factors are being shown to be an issue here, that we can be the catalyst that helps everyone nationwide. The women at the bridge pointed to the need for systemic, structural and ideological changes that would target policy, regulation, law and other risk mitigation strategies through a systems approach. So through that lens, there are a number of ways that interventions for prevention are possible. And I'm happy to say that at CAPE, uh, we are intervening in a number of ways, including federally. Uh, we are campaigning for Canadian Environmental Protection Act reform that we know in future needs to address air pollution. Uh, this is Canada's main pollution prevention law, which is more than two decades out of date. As well, we're campaigning for the passage of Bill C-226, which is an act to redress environmental racism and for environmental justice as I said, and as Emily pointed to, air pollution and its impacts are disproportionately realized by uh, populations of people who are racialized, Indigenous, and so forth. At the regional committee level, chapters such as Cape Ontario are advocating against provincial policies that allow urban sprawl and the air pollution that goes along with it. And at the municipal level, tackling policies related to sprawl, transportation, active transportation, and more, which can impact uh, air pollution and health. And we're also contributing and disseminating the research on air pollution and health, including importantly around marginalized and vulnerableized people. We've also contributed to uh, budget 20, uh, 2022 deliberations, and we're arguing for an end to fossil fuel subsidies and advertising of fossil fuels, which contribute significantly to air pollution and health, or rather ill health. As Cindy from the bridge said, Sometimes you just need someone to plant the right seed about things. So the seed I want to plant here tonight is that air pollution and the adverse health impacts related to it is a design problem, as Ted Shetler said. To prevent future breast cancers and other illnesses related to air pollution at the bridge, in the community around the bridge, and in communities across the globe, we need political will and those with power to implement, enforce, and extend policies that prevent air pollution and the associated illnesses because individual control over environmental exposures, health risks and outcomes is not always possible. The right to a healthy environment and environmental justice are fundamental to this work. Thank you.